why I said it's got a battery that I never knew existed. So I get to sit down here. Um, anybody not able to hear me? I normally have a pretty loud <coughs> voice. Yeah. Okay, I'll be nice. Okay. Well, I've got a mic, but I'm so used to talking over water that um, normally people tell me, could you talk a little quieter? You're disturbing our class. So I just figure, you know, I, I wind up yelling into the mic. Okay. Um, so as um, Scott introduced, and for those of you who don't know me, I am uh, with Coast Watch, which is a program of Oregon Shores. Um, Oregon Shores is a, um, an organization that actually was um, part of the grassroots group that helped to pass the beach bill um, years ago. And for those of you who are new to Oregon, um, Oregon is the only state with all public beaches. So some of them are a little bit more challenging to get to, but if you're on that beach, they can't keep you off and there should be no fences going down. We actually had a volunteer down in uh, Bandit. Uh, a couple weeks ago who was down there because, and said something to this group of people who were building a bonfire um, near the driftwood. And she said, well, you can't build it there, you know, because it's just not safe. And they said, well, this is a private beach. And she's going, yeah, guess what? <laughs> You're in Oregon now. No, that's their state. So, um, yeah. So you can keep that in mind. So um, Coast Watch uh, is a program that Philip, our director, kind of came up uh, with when he was in Salem at another meeting, finding out that he'd missed out on something else that was happening at the coast. And so with that, he started a program of volunteers that adopt a mile of beach. And uh, we asked at least four times a year that you kind of, you know, that you had uh, go out and check on your beach. Um, the whole idea is to recognize changes that you see happening on the beach or events that may be of concern. And so with that, one of the things that we had, of course, was in uh, 2011 with the tsunami from Japan, we knew that we were going to be getting some major amounts of debris from that. And we got it as soon as um, early in uh, 2012. Uh, the first boat that actually showed up was a little skiff that washed up in Seaside, another one right up in West Wind. But the one in Seaside had five little fish in there, uh, plus a whole bunch of other algae. And so Keith Chandler, the curator there, went right out, scooped one out, you know, took it into the aquarium and called ODFW. They came out and euthanized everything. So Tsunami Sue is alive and well at the Seaside Aquarium. Uh, I have one of the siblings, though, not so well. Uh, but that way, you know, but we've seen now since then, um, because of the debris coming in, we've got a lot of live organisms that are coming in on this debris. Last March, we had... Uh, the crab, uh, a crab ring out in Port Orford, when the guy pulled it up, there was uh, another one of these striped beak fish in that. Then it was later on in June when they had the half a boat that was off Seal Rock that they pulled in and it had another one of the striped beak fish and some yellowtail jacks. Fish that we would normally be swimming with if we were in warm waters type of thing. Um, so there is concern over that. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at is um, what kind of debris is coming in on our beaches. Uh, as I mentioned last year, we work with NOAA, and one of the things that we're looking at is the type of mar marine debris, because we didn't have a baseline. What kind of debris is coming in on our beaches? Um, what is going to be tsunami debris? What is, you know, regular marine debris that we've probably seen for years, including the glass floats we had talked about, things like that. Um, and so with that, uh, we've been since 2012 actually setting up marine debris monitoring sites all along the whole, whole Oregon coast. We started out with just a couple the first year, and then now we're up to, I think, 11 or 12 of them. And we've just got organizations. But what we did have last year was a graduate student from um, Edinburgh, Scotland, who called me and said, I would like to come over to Oregon uh, be a volunteer and look at the data that you guys have collected so that I can see how citizen science relates to actual data. And so with that, his project um, was born. And so this is what his program is about. He's uh, since gone back to Scotland. And so I am here to help with his um, information. So his research project was using our data from the marine debris. And he took around um, or looked at about 917 data points 
to try and you know, get this all together. Um, he did remove outliers because he not only used Coast Watch information, but he went on to the NOAA website to see other data that's been collected by NOAA along the whole um, Pacific Northwest as well. So his focus was on the modeling, the marine debris data, uh, the data, as I mentioned, used from NOAA and from Coast Watchers, and also identifying the influence of citizen science. How are we actually helping with this, or are we, you know, an aid in this program? So uh, one of the things that he looked at as far as model factors, of course, was what year was it? Because as we looked at the data from NOAA, their projection was is that we would see a little bit the first year, a little more the second year, but then we'd start to see the amount of marine debris dwindling over the next few years. And so what he wanted to do is take a look at that and see if that actually fit their model. Um, of course, with NOAA, the model was that things weren't going to come until like the second or third year. And of course, we had that big dock that washed up on the, you know, the following year, one year later. Um, so the time since the last survey. In this case, most of our surveys are done once a month. He, the uh, participants go out to the same 100 meters on their beach. They collect all the marine debris and they you know, categorize it. And so it's the, um, the, sometimes they can't get out there exactly the same time depending on the weather and their beach. Um, latitude and longitude, where is it up and uh, down the coast? The storm activity, as we all know, when we get those nice west winds in, we are pretty much gonna be guaranteed we're gonna find stuff on our beaches at that point. Uh, the number of people that were assisting to uh, actually see what was going on, because if you're out there by yourself, you're normally in a hurry and you're not going to see as much as other eyes are going to see. And then the days since the last survey. So this was the form that we used, and this is the form that's used by all of NOAA up and down the coast. Uh, the first thing we do is we go out and we set up a sampling site. Um, and that gives the latitude, longitude, and the, you know, the general information. What does your beach look like as compared to the other beaches? And for those of you, again, who have been on the Oregon coast, our beaches are really dramatically different along the coastline. Uh, you don't see all those sandy beaches from you know, hundreds of miles. What you see is rocky outcroppings and tide pools and sandy areas and then dunes forever type of thing. So it's quite a variety. And then while they're out there, um, once a month, they actually fill out the form on the, your left-hand side that says, what was the weather like, okay? What was, um, what time did you go out? Um, again, how many people were out there? Are you going to the same latitude, longitude? We hope so. Um, and then any photos that you took so that we, they have a general idea of what to look at. And then of that, you can see it's all categorized. What's in the plastics? Um, metal, glass, and yeah, metal and glass. Okay, so these are the, this is what you're looking at on those forms here. And then what you wanted to do was to see if there need to be some changes in that. So, um, when we looked at this, um, the amount of debris in each year, what we did find, of course, is that it increased a little bit more each time. There was a 373 increase of marine debris from 2013 to 2015. There's quite a bit of debris that came in. Um, from 2013 to 2014, we, already, we always get that amount of debris. We had some information from 2012. So going from that as being a baseline, we saw the increases from that, okay? Um, so then here, when he looks at this, now the dates on the bottom aren't right, and he and poor Michael tried to fix them numerous times because it's 2012 to 2015, and um, but he keeps coming up 2016 to 2020. We don't we don't know why it wants to do that, but, but it's not right. And every time he tried to go in there and fix it, it kept coming up 2020. So I don't know if it's trying to predict the future or what's going on. Excel, what can we say? But what this shows you is that um, in uh, December of 2012, um, or let's see, let's see, what's I looking at here? Uh, 2014, December of 2014 was the actual large amount of debris. So I have my notes here to remind you what date because that will confuse me. So yeah, so 2014 is when we saw a massive amount of debris coming in. 
And what we're looking at is then, okay, what kind of degree is coming in? And so with that, we're looking at, okay, 86% was plastic. Um, there were, a, the next largest amount was just processed lumber because what we have to keep in mind is all these people's houses, all those buildings, um, all those temples were all washed into the water. And um, so there was a lot of processed lumber that came. And the way we know it was their lumber is because of the fact that they use actual mortise and tenon, where you have the wood that's put into the groove, you know, tiny groove type of stuff, where, you know, we're lazy Americans. We use our 16 penny nail gun and bam, 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 and we've got a house. We're good, you know? But they actually still use really good construction. So we saw their lumber coming in as well as um, seeing some rubber, clothing, fabric, things like that, and some metals. We started seeing tires coming in. All along the coastline, we started to see all these little tiny tires coming in. And then we wanted to find out, well, if we break it down, what kind of plastics and lumber are we getting? So 49% is styrofoam or foam plastic. And so then if you look at that, then the hard plastic is only about 23%, and the same with um, the lumber is about 5% of that. And then everything else was just um, a variety of things that we would find out there. Okay, so then what he did was he looked at the amount of uh, marine debris, and categorized, that's the way you spell it in Europe. I know, <laughs> I go through periodically to change things. I'm like, well, that wasn't mine. Um, so categorized marine debris found throughout all the sites and surveys. So what he did was he tried to put this on a graph, but as you can see, that hard plastic and that foam plastic skewed everything. Oh. It looks like there was nothing else coming in except these plastics. So then what he decided, well, I'll take the plastic out. And then you can see in reality all the different types of things that were coming in on the beach. Uh, we had everything from film, plastic, a lot of plastic bottles, a lot of bottle caps washing in on the beach. Uh, the other thing, other types of plastic, ropes and net. Obviously, we're always getting ropes and net, but this was one of those that you could really see how much ropes and net we get all the time on our beaches. And then, of course, the lumber, which was um, quite large, and then other types of small pieces of lumber, you know, just little things. Um, shelves that came in or um, the, the, like the, the tops of the temples in some areas came in. I know one came in on Sear Walk. Um, other types of little processed things that we saw coming in. And so then what we did was looked at the amount of plastic found each year. And as you can see again, uh, from 2013 to 2015, um, there was about a 370% increase in the amount of plastic. Whereas from 2013 to 2014, it was 236, and then it's getting increasingly less, but we're still getting the plastic in from, um, from all this debris. And so again, the next thing he wanted to look at was the percentage of marine debris found at each site. Now, as I mentioned, at this time we had um, nine, well, we had 10 sites, but the one up in Cannon Beach, um, they, were, they didn't actually get any data from it. So what he did was he took that one out, and you can see that down in Rocky Point, which is um, down in Port Orford, they had 51% of the debris. And then when you look at the other sites, though, they all had some debris. But in reality, uh, Rocky Point, this is our Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve, and that whole community team had gotten together, and so right after the tsunami, they actually started um, doing um, marine debris surveys. That was one of the things that they took on before we ever got the rest of these teams together. So it made sense that they would have more data. Um, so, but then what you want to do, it, you know, does the, the previous figure lie in it and say, well, so they looked at the graph of Rocky Point, which is down in Port Orchard, and wanted to know uh, what else would be, um, how much was actually found at all the other sites at that time. And so, again, Muriel Consular was another one that was started pretty much right after that. That was uh, started by Surfrider down at Muriel Consular. And so that was a site that was up and running very quickly as well. 
Uh, and then the other sites, as we came on, um, we started getting a little bit more from that, um, from those groups as well. And so Tehokvich is a newer one, Western was a newer one, Neokani uh, was a newer one, and Gold Beach, the first year they did really well, um, it was the 4-H group down there at the time, and then after that, they we couldn't get the 4-Hers out on the beach again. So they're going, yeah, we're, you know, we want to go surfing, but we don't really want to go pick up the debris. So, <laughs> so we're working on that one again. Um, so then the next thing that Michael put up here was the average amount of marine debris found by each survey again. Um, you can see Otter Rock was, there wasn't much there. We, um, we, we had just started that one a little bit later. I got the group, it's the Community Services Consortium. Uh, so there are kids there that go out and do the marine debris survey. And at different times, there's just not much debris in that little pocket. But there, we also had to look at the outliers there. It's just below Otter Rock um, in Otter Crest. And there are their maintenance people, their landscaping people who go down there and also um, clean up. And so I had to go down and let them know, if you could just leave this. I know it's kind of rough because you have guests up there, but, or at least let us know what you're collecting. That would be helpful. Um, so yeah, so these are, again, the percentage um, was just about the same. It just showed that, you know, Rocky Point, they had a lot. But Neocani had a lot of debris also, even though they started much later. This is Neocani High School. So as you can tell, I've got groups of all different ages, and um, we actually have now Coronado Shores, a group of the uh, neighborhood people there are doing the marine debris survey there. Um, OMSI is now taking up uh, doing surveys at... Um, South Beach State Park, and um, I was, I was see Newport High School is going to be doing the north side of the jetty. So we're getting all kinds of groups, and if you want to do it on your beach, we can get you up and going there too. Okay, so then this one, um, the debris found during 2012, 2015 by site again. What he did was he just took the two top, Muriel Ponsler and Rocky Point, and you can still see that there was a lot of debris coming in at Port Orford first before it was making its way up to Muriel Ponsler. Um, Naturally, our concern is the foam plastic. So the amount of foam plastic found throughout 2012 and 2015, and again, oh, this was just the right date on the bottom. Uh, again, right at 2014, 2015, we started seeing a spike in all the styrofoam that was coming in. Um, all along the whole Oregon coast, we saw lots of styrofoam. Even in my co the Coast Watch reports, that's what I was seeing a lot of in the Coast Watch reports as well. And then the hard plastic, again, the dates are skewed here, so the middle is actually 2014. But what you see is the amount of hard plastic. And so this is what we saw then, um, 2014, 2015, because this is ending in around um, uh, the end of 2015 here, it was actually a lot of the heavier, harder plastic that was coming in then. So we saw the full plastic coming in first, and then this heavier, hard plastic um, that we're seeing come in. Um, so when he looked at all of his data, one of the things that he felt needed to be improved was a better description of the weather on the reports so that we knew a little bit more of what was happening at that time that would have brought the debris in, and also the weight. How much is it? Because if we're just, you know, writing down, you know, this much of this, you really don't know how much weight of styrofoam you have. Um, and so what we have now is using solve. And Surfrider, they have estimated weights, so we can go out there. And um, one of the things that I, uh, my son-in-law sent me because I always, um, I'm always on the edge of having my suitcases too heavy when I go visit. So you got to do one of those really great luggage scale things. And so what I'm going to try to do is see about getting a little grant to get uh, scales for everybody who has their marine debris survey, so we can then weigh it because you know it gives us a an idea of what what it is. Because taking pictures shows you what's there, just not how much in any case. So these are things that he felt that would make it more universal um, all the way around. And so that would be looking at the data sheet here, where we look at the storm activity in the bottom. 
again, making this a little bit more detailed, or on there saying, you know, A, very stormy, B, you know, not so bad, C, this type of thing, to give us a better way of gauging what the storms are like, because all of our perspectives are a little different. You know, for those of us who live in the coast, when they say, oh, you're going to have a 60 mile an hour wind, we all go, shh, yeah, okay. You know, in the valley, they're going, really? We're not coming to the beach. It's 60 mile an hour winds, you know? So it's all a matter of perspective. So this gives us an idea. And so this was my um, conclusion uh, that we need to get, obviously, more data, because the more data you have, uh, the better picture you get of what's happening along the coast as well. Um, that we need to be able to do a little bit more comparison, and again, the more data, the more knowledge. So this is what this is what he felt that we needed to work on, and this is what he also told NOAA, since they're this is their program that we're um, participating in. So how can you help? Well, um, when you're out on the beach, for those of you who have, have adopted your mile, or if you'd like to adopt your mile of each, uh, scouting. You're the ones who are on the beach to see the stuff wash in. So it's, you know, if you're there, you're the one who's going to be able to say, hey, you know, we need to do something about this. Um, clean up. In this case, when we uh, get out there, you know, if we can get it cleaned up right away, that's even better. And then monitoring. Once a month, going out there and, you know, monitoring the beaches to see exactly what is coming on your beach. Um, and the larger your team, the less you have to put on your shoulders for doing it. And it's a lot of fun. The uh, Cape Falcon group, they get out there, they do their survey, then they go back in, open up a couple bottles of wine and a few beers and party out while they're separating out their, um, uh, serve, you know, their debris and stuff. That's a lot of fun. Of course, you know, then I had to stay there that night, but whatever. <laughs> now you have company, you can't drive. <laughs> Um, so this is the first part, scouting. Um, Coast Watch, as we mentioned, always, has always taken the lead in doing this um, because we're out there anyway. Uh, we encourage more of your visits, especially after the first storms start to come in. We kind of encourage a few more visits to your beach. Um, you'll also have a better chance of getting your glass floats then, hint, hint. Um, and, and especially, you know, getting more people into re the remote areas because um, it's a little bit more challenging. So if you have people who you know like to hike or have ATVs or something like that and like to go like the dune areas or, um, or you know, around the little rocky areas, then um, that's really helpful as well. And now we have the quadcopters. You have to have your permit now, but we do have some of our volunteers. Britton, who normally caters, or his brother caters stuff, um, he's used his quadcopter around Cape Perpetua. Um, so Eves has the first part of the mile, and then Britton has taken his for the rocky part. So they kind of share, which is nice. Okay. And then um, cleanup. This is where we come into rapid response. Um, and if you can see uh, down here on the bottom left, um, Mike is my husband, but Bob, Zach, Mark, and Don. The, net, the morning after the talk here that I gave, I got calls from these guys saying, there's this mass of rope down here on the Yahats, okay? And so before I could even get dressed, the second call came in, there's a massive thing of a rope down here in Yahats. So I said, okay, I've already called the state parks so let them know. And by the time I got down here from Seal Rock, they were already cutting and hauling and headed up to the sign, and I had the beach rangers ready to collect it the next day. But that's what's important because the problem is, is if the longer it's left there, you have to you know, it's harder to get it dug out of the sand because that sand comes in and then it's almost impossible to get it off the beach. So it's really important that as soon as you see it, we get it in. So last year also, um, we had, well, I talked before about the picture up on your right-hand side. That was a dock that had washed down the Coquille. It had two boats attached to it. And so the Coast Guard uh, hooked the two boats and let the dock go out. But the weather wasn't so bad, but then a storm came in and blew it into Lighthouse Beach, which is a tiny little pocket beach. And the only way down to it is down this little cl cliffy path that the surfers take to get to it. And so it was two days later before they could get down there. And so they got many of the big, huge chunks of styrofoam off there. Um, but then you can see there's that. But then when you see left there, all those 
billions and billions of styrofoam pellets. Oh. They are still going down whenever they get a good low tide with sieves oh. and sifting styrofoam pellets oh. out of there. So then shortly after that, um, I got a call, first of all, from uh, Gather Walport, uh, a volunteer saying, there's this uh, dock that's sitting on Bayshore. And so um, about, and just right after that, um, Ryan Parker, who's the beach ranger, called and said, Fawn, can you get some help down here? We need to get these styrofoam chunks off the beach before the storm comes in. So I was able to call all the coast watchers that were there in the area. We got down there, as you can see, they weren't heavy, they were just big and bulky, and moved them up off the beach there. And then the sitting down in the bottom center, that was at Salishan. Shortly about, uh, uh, I think it was only a month after that, maybe even a couple weeks. Same thing. Two docks washed down from Salishan, or from the, um, uh, the river up there, I'll think of it in a second. Anyway, washed it from there. And so this was on the north end of Salishan um, spit. So we all got out there and hauled all this styrofoam, styrofoam in off the beach there also. But that's the thing is the sooner we can get it off there, the, um, the less we have to deal with. It's so much easier to deal with these massive big chunks that are really lightweight than it is billions and billions of little styrofoam pellets. So the, this is the reason for you know keeping our eyes out and see what's happening out there. Um, so identifying the debris origin. Last year from the um, video uh, that I showed people, it was called, um, and I was given the honor to show it here, was the It's Everyone's Ocean. <coughs> and. Um, this was about a group of um, students in Okinawa, well, the o Okinawa Prefecture um, for an island called Ikema. And these kids have been doing this for 10 years, going out, cleaning up their beaches, mm -hmm. and primarily finding debris from other people's countries mm -hmm. on their beaches. But they were able to identify it using the UPC <coughs> symbols on the bottles there and on the lids. Um, and so you can get a better graphic of where is stuff coming from also that we're seeing on our beach. Um, and so that's what we want to do too is what is tsunami? Japan gave us a lot of money to clean up tsunami debris, but it's not fair to have them also pay for our regular marine debris that's coming in off the Russian ships and the Korean ships and our ships, you know, and also the party stuff from people going down to our beaches and leaving their trash down there, you know. It's not fair for that. So it's again, it's good to have that idea of an understanding of what is the tsunami debris. So when the dock came in, um, one of the things that they did is collect, obviously, quite a number of different species off of that dock. Um, some of them they're still working on identifying the species. Uh, the, uh, the, the ones that we want you to really keep an eye out for would be the sea star up at the top that's the Northern Pacific Sea Star. It's actually a cream colored sea star and it has purple eye shadow. And the reason I say that is because on the end of each arm of a sea star it has eye spots so they can see um, and so they'll be deep purple. So that way they have eye shadow. Um, our sea stars are normally purple all the way through or brownish or yellowish, you know, that color. Um, or red solid, but we don't have any that are, you know, cream with the purple eyeshadow. So if you see that coming in on any plastic or marine debris, then we really want to get that off because they're highly invasive in other areas. And so they could prove to be here also. The Japanese shore crab looks a lot like our shore crabs, our little purple shore crabs, only ours are solid purple arms. Theirs have white bars across their arms. So that's a way to identify those. And if you see them, on, you know, see shore crabs on the beach, unless you see them with some debris, I wouldn't be concerned, you know, um, with that. Sometimes ours even have little variations because um, they haven't been in a lot of light, so you see them kind of bleached sometimes, or you know, different shades. But if you see it like on plastic debris or something that we know has come in floating, then that would be a reason for concern. The other thing, um, the Nemescal provincialis, which is the mussel that's in the center, um, really easily identifiable. I have those on the table as well, most of these specimens. Um, it's very smooth. It'll look like our bay mussels that we have, but um, if it's coming in on plastic, especially if it's got Asian writing on it, writing on it then you're going to know that it's not, you know, our bay mussels coming in. 
and they're still coming in, okay? Um, the same with the pink barnacle up at the top. Um, uh, these are Balanus rosacea. We do have, Curry County is our lovely stepchild down in you know, the southern part of Oregon, and Curry County has all those animals that we don't have, you know, unusual things. They also have pink barnacles, which I had no idea until I was at my in-laws, and I'm going, and they cleaned up the yard, and I'm like, well, where'd you get all those pink barnacles? Because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're being invaded by Japanese barnacles. And, and Great Grandpa says, ah, oh, no, that's, they're down here all the time. So now we know uh, that this particular species, if we see it up here, it's definitely not native. Okay, so that's the pink barnacle. And then the other plant that would be most recognizable out of all this is the Undaria uh, pinneopida. Uh, this is actually a brown kelp. And I've got a species over there, and also the um, poster, I've got another picture to show you. Um, but it's at the bottom, if you see ribbons, especially in the spring, none of our kelps do that. Mm -hmm. So that little ribbony thing that you see is at the bottom, and that's its reproductive um, parts. Okay, so those are key things to look for. If you see big things, we can almost guarantee that if there are algaes on there, there are little things in there too. So that's what we want to be aware of. So how do you tell the difference between native and non-native? Well, on the left side, those are just our regular um, pelagic barnacles. They come in on anything that's been floating out in the open ocean. Um, they're not invasive whatsoever. Uh, as a matter of fact, all the animals consider them a delicate, uh, delicacy. And that boat that came in from Japan had huge ones on it. And if I'd known when I'd gone down there, they apparently taste like a lobster. <laughs> I know. It's like, I may be fighting the birds for that. Get away here, girls. We'll see. Um, on the right-hand side, that boat has a colonial tunicate that's growing on it. Um, and it's kind of a slimy-looking animal. Um, unfortunately, it's also the closest thing to us phylogenically. It's a uropornate or hemicornate. Um, but when it's in its adult stage, it kind of grows over the top of everything and anything. It will outcompete any native species. So these are things that you want to be aware of when you are looking at some of these. Um, so this is it, uh, some of the pictures. The boats have been coming in. We have eight boats now that have come in since January um, on the Oregon coast. Um, and you know, and at different times. The one on the top, as you can see, Coos Bay in April, there was a volunteer that was up on top taking a picture and calling me. <laughs> Things I get on my cell phone, I should say. Um, and of course, so I had, uh, I contact John and the beach ranger down there right away. Uh, Port Orford in March, there was a boat that came in that was broken apart. Um, so they were down there again, still trying to collect species off of that. Then this is one that just came in uh, July 24th up at Cove Beach. That group that was up there was heading out there to do their marine survey and they hadn't really seen anything for a couple months and, and, and they were pretty excited. So you can see actually they're flipping head over heels that they found something big on the beach. Um, uh, but then as you can see, it was for, they identified on the 24th John Chapman was on his way back from Washington from a conference. I was in Bend, Oregon. I get this call, and it wasn't until the 26th when we could get down there. So as you can see by then, digging it out of the sand. And that takes a long time. Even though it was being dug out of the sand, there were lots of live organisms on there. The, the pelagic barnacles on there, you see that pink crusty algae though. Um, I'll mention a little bit about that because Gail Hansen has information on that research that she's doing. Um, and the pink barnacle, very much alive, tucked down inside there. Uh, he was, doc, Dr. Chapman was surprised not to see any mussels on there because we normally see them on everything. But instead we did get a lot of different algaes that were on there as well. And so this was their report. Uh, there was the different type of algae, um, and you can see Gail Hansen is the biologist or the um, who studies the algae. Um, she was going to send them off to Japan because she didn't recognize some of the species right off. And she's pretty renowned for knowing the species of algae around here. Uh, Doctor, um, it was. OPRD, Jim Carlton, Ken Murphy up there who were able to get up there and help dig it out. 
Vivian Tolman and um, Tara were part of the team that was out doing their marine debris survey and taking the pictures of what was going on. But so what you see here is the different out, um, animals and even inside this float that was on the boat was live organisms in there. So these are things that we want to keep, you know, keep a lookout for. So another thing, of course, last year, and what we're going to see again is debris coming in in waves. Because depending on the storm's activity and the density of the plastics will determine when something's going to come in. Um, last year in, um, I think it was, I'm trying to remember if it was March or April, we started getting all the laundry baskets in and all the baskets. This was a dish drainer down at Quail Street, which, well, up at Quail Street for you guys. <laughs> um, my husband had called and said, oh, wow, there's a whole bunch of weird stuff down there, you know, because he likes to walk that beach. So I went down there, of course, to take pictures. And, um, and he said, but I bought a dish drainer home. I thought you might like it for the garden. I said, perfect. So I, I brought it in, I, you know, I went and looked at it, and sure enough, there was a live mussel, um, Asian mussel on the side of it, along with those hydroids and things like that. So of course, I, I took those up to um, Dr. Chapman and said, I want the distrator back. I still have it for my garden. So, uh, um, so this one, this is what you're looking for, because they're sneaky little suckers. <laughs> Well then, while I was there, I also, there was a chunk of styrofoam, oh, about this big, okay? And it had this curly stuff on it, and I'm going, I don't recognize it because it was hard, you know, so I'm going, I'm not really sure what that is. So I called Dr. Chapman again and said, okay, I have this chunk of styrofoam. Don't know what it, what's on here. So I brought it up, and of course we started looking at everything. And he says, oh, it's a bryozoan, which is a colonial animal, by the way, that forms all that. And, um, but he, he says, we don't know what makes the holes in the styrofoam. And I said, well, let's cut this puppy open. And we did. And these two live crabs were in there. Oh. Yes. The um, one on the um, left is actually a male. And that's that Japanese shore crab that we were talking about. On the right is another little um, crab. It's a female. Um, but we don't know the species. And actually, he wasn't even sure that was the uh, Japanese species of shore crab. He was going to look, um, he had to send all these specimens off to, um, he sent all these specimens off east um, to get them to identify them because he needed to have some, you know, Japanese researchers identify the species for us. And my last email to him, I hadn't heard back yet what they were. I also called Cynthia Trowbridge, Cynthia. By the way. So I'm waiting to hear from her also, because she does a lot of research in uh, Okinawa, and so she would recognize some of these um, Asian species. Well, then the other thing that we found, and I was down up on 68th Street with the aquarium group doing their marine debris survey, and um, looking at sea stars, and as I was walking up again, taking pictures of the pile of debris, I saw this jug that had some Asian writing on it and these little black things in there. So I looked in there and thought, hmm, they look like anemones. They're still viable. I took them to the uh, Marine Science Center. We put them in water, and as you can see, they just perked right up. So um, again, <laughs> he's not really sure. He knows that they are anthropleural, which is the same species or genus as our green anemones and our elegant anemones, the little pink ones, but we just don't know the species. So um, this is what we're, you know, these are still things, and they're coming in alive. You know, they're floating out in that ocean, getting plenty of food, apparently. So this is why we need to be diligent about what we're looking for, and not just, you know, think, okay, there's, you know, nothing in there, because apparently there's all kinds of stuff in there. And I actually also, I don't have a photograph of it, it must still be on my phone, um, that I sent to Dr. Chapman, but um, was just last month, up in Rhodes End, up there on um, our Coast Wars 245, right? Rhodes End, one of our old volunteers picked up a little container and inside had some live anemones in that one also with Asian writing. So, so these are things that we're still kind of looking for. Okay, um, and then this is uh, the pink algae that we, I've got the poster on there. Dr. Hansen all of a sudden realized, wait a minute, 
This is, this is not native to our area, this pink crusty algae. We have the red coralline algae that grows, but this is more like a little pink crusty stuff. And so she um, actually started putting a call out to everybody, if you find any plastic with pink crusty stuff, to turn it in. So I do have a bucket over there that you can see. It doesn't really look like the coralline algae, but it's just a really light pale pink kind of growth that's on, um, on the plastic. And the white just makes it easy to identify. So this was a jug that I picked up and it was definitely um, from, you know, it was definitely Japanese, the writing on there. Can't see it in this picture I took, but it was definitely Japanese. And so I sent that in. Oh, and it's sitting on top of my bucket. That's why it says Coast Wants Coffee. Because <laughs> I had to send it there and take a picture. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. More advertisement for Coast Watch. Mm -hmm. We do offer coffee and tea. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is what it looked like. Um, the microscopic details of the pink crust. It was a Rhodophora, um, which is a red algae, um, from the white plastic. So this is what she's looking at. So this is why this is different than our pink coral and algae that grows. Our pink coral and algae grows um, by putting, you know, by spreading out, but also putting up. Um, the um, the growths that stick out to make the really pretty fans and things like that. This is completely different looking organism. All right, so this is her information on that. Um, if you see white plastic with any pink crusty, it actually does come on other colored plastics. It's just that it's easier to see on the white. Um, she's still trying to, you know, make sure that she gets all the information she can on that. But it's definitely a way for us to determine whether or not it's um, tsunami debris or just stuff that's been floating out in the open ocean. And then for John Chapman um, and Jessica Miller, they're at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. So if you see something that, you know, you have questions about, you're free to call them. You can call the Marine Science Center for John and for Jessica, and they'll, you know, um, get your information in. You can call me. I've got him on speed dial. I can find him and text him. And if you have something on your beach, uh, we can get there and get it off your beach. Okay? Not a problem. Uh, Gail is actually in the um, EPA building, so uh, we would have to call her office. If it's of a major concern, you think it's not safe, you've got 1-800-SAFE-NET, um, and somebody told me that the 211 number is working again. It's always, it's always kind of iffy thing. But if you think there's something of concern, um, you could also give me a call. Even if I'm in Bend or in Virginia, wherever I'm at, I can still, thank goodness for cell phones, I can call and get hold of um, the researchers or the beach rangers or whoever needs to deal with whatever we need to deal with. And these were the marine debris survey sites. You're welcome to join any of those sites and help with the um, help those surveys if you are interested. Um, you know, let me know and I will get you in contact with those people. Or if you'd like to start your own marine debris survey site, that would be great also. Um, the more, again, the more sites we have, the better picture we get of what's happening on our coastline. And so your opportunities help. Yeah, adopt your mile, become a scout. That's the best way that you can help um, determine what we see on our beaches. Um, you can also support Coast Watch by becoming an Oregon Shore member. And, you know, we're a nonprofit. We take donations. <laughs> we're, we're easy. Um, and then this is my information. This is my cell phone, again, so you feel free. My cards are over there on the table. The information that you have over there on the Marine Debris Surveys, all that has my information as well. Um, you're, you're free to look at any of that. And so um, that's it for this. And if you have any questions, we can, you know, you can look at the specimens on the table and I can um, answer any questions. Yes, ma'am. What about other areas, uh, north of us and south of us, other than Oregon? Are they doing something similar? Uh, somewhat similar, but they don't have the, um, they don't have a Coast Watch program like ours. So what they're dependent on is their researchers getting out there or college students. So one of the pluses of Oregon is that we have this nice base of volunteers on the beach. And so, you know, I get these calls saying, okay, there's a boat on my beach and I can call John um, or I call the beach rangers and say, okay, um, 
is it is it safe to can you get it off the beach or what what do we need to get help down there? And so that's the advantage here in Oregon is that we do have that better base out there. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Early on, my wife and I volunteered, and we were assigned to Washburn State Park Beach. Okay. Uh, did nothing come up there? Um, I have not see anything big there, uh, but I have, I was, I was out with a school group this last summer, and we just collected some small things, but nothing, nothing big. But of course, the thing in the summer, and this is what everybody should kind of keep in mind right now, is that during the summer we have what's called beach building waves, and so all the sand kind of comes in and covers all this stuff. And then when we get those storms in, that's going to start scouring out things, probably start showing up, you know, some of the stuff that got discovered in the summer when no, nobody was on that particular beach, and so you may see it then as well, as well as new debris coming in. Is there something structural at Brown Pond that is just real different than Washburn? Or how does it all come in the Um, uh, uh, Mira Consul really doesn't get that much. After the first boat, they've only gotten small <coughs> types of plastic, but um, nothing really major in their... Um, Right, yeah, they, it's mostly small plastics that they find there. Um, and again, their beach is somewhat limited because between March and September, there's a whole section that's snowy plover. So they have to avoid one whole section when they're doing their survey at Muriel Ponsler anyway. Um, but that didn't happen until we had already set up the site. Then the snowy plovers came in, you know, so... <laughs> Darn birds. <laughs> Mother nature. Yes, ma'am. Could you find something like this, like the, the pink crusties on algae? Do you want us to contact you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, as soon as you contact me, I can contact Gail. It's easier for you guys to remember my one phone number than to remember all of their phone numbers. And so um, if you want to do that, that's just as easy. So we should collect it and then. Yes, yeah. If you find something with live animals on it, um, not all of you are like me, and we'll put them in your freezer. Uh, <laughs> to my family's dismay, I should say. Uh, but I only put it in one freezer, so they know it's safe to go to the other ones. Um, but, you know, bag them and put them in the fridge, the, the animals, or in a freezer. Or if you call us right away, we can get down. As long as they stay cool. Um, that you, and you can freeze any of the animals. But the algae, um, Dr. Hansen asked that you let it go uh, be dry, you know, um, don't freeze it because that bursts the little cells oh. in the plants and then um, it's harder for her to identify the algae. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. What do you do with the styrofoam? We can make it to the landfill. Ah. Okay, so here's the thing. I have all these bags over there. Um, one of the things that you can, and you can all take as many bags as you like, you get at state parks. When you collect all the styrofoam or any of the marine debris, if you leave it sitting out the tr outside the trash can at the state parks or at the entrance to the state parks, the beach rangers come up and they collect all that. They have that special dumpster for marine debris. Mm -hmm. And the styrofoam was actually used by Wash to Shore, which is another one of our marine debris partners down in Bandon. Um, if you've not been down there, it's amazing. They take all this marine debris. Mary and her family will hop in a U-Haul. They'll drive up, hit all the dumpsters, collect the debris, and build massive sculptures. They have volunteers who do that down in Bandon. And so, I mean, we're talking huge sculptures. They have them, um, when I was back visiting in Virginia, uh, just a couple weeks ago with my uh, family, the National Zoo, they are, they've got sculptures there at the National Zoo now. Um, but they've got them at the World, you know, or the um, Sea Worlds. You know, but they're just, and that's all she does is use marine debris. So she may put out a call, like they did when they were doing the octopus. Okay, any red and orange plastic you get, uh. we'll come and get it right away. We need a raw octopus. So. <laughs> This is a uh, at Wash Shore. Uh, Angela is the um, curator down there. Yeah. So.
So it gets used. Does it just have an exhibit at the Newport Art Center a couple years ago? They may have. There's always yeah. There there always there's always something coming up that they're doing next yeah. on their wash the sword sign. Yes, sir. Um, when you were showing the initial graphs earlier on in the talk, the the volume, um, the vertical column, was that just discrete number of things? Is that what they were counting there? Because uh, you you said they were going to change it to weight, but they hadn't got, got done that yet. Oh yeah, he what well, what he wanted to do is he wanted to add weight to it um, because it's kind of hard in some cases when you're. The way the report goes, it's like, okay, you've had so much um, plastic, you know, and what we do when we're doing the survey is we're actually counting um, plastic that is about the size of a bottle cap and up, okay, that's what we're supposed to count. But lots of times when you have a lot of microplastics, the little plastics, the groups will get them together and take a picture of the pile. That still doesn't tell you how much is really there, it's kind of a hard perspective. So what, what uh, Michael was suggesting is that we added weight to that as well to give you a better idea of how much they're actually collecting. And that was all the stuff that washed up on the beach, whether or not we think it came from Japan, from the tsunami? Right. And what we try to do in the reports is to identify anything that had Asian markings. And so photographs, what we try to do, of course, is uh, when you submit your reports, you also submit photographs with those reports. And so zooming in on anything that had um, Asian writing or something that you know, would give us a better idea of where it could have come from. Anything else? Well, thank you guys so much for...